Okay, all right then, everybody. First of all, welcome to this fourth webinar organized by the Klingendal Russia and Eastern Europe Center, uh, created in order to stimulate debate about Russia, knowledge about Russia and Eastern Europe within the Netherlands and a wider audience. Uh, and I'm glad that we can do these webinars to bring together people from the Russian Federation, from the United States and from Europe here for a debate on a topic that concerns us all, namely how the increasing tensions on the geopolitical level are affecting European security. And I'm particularly glad that we can do so with three eminent experts. It is my pleasure to introduce them to you and then we'll divide up the discussion into three parts on, on three aspects of this very broad question of what increased rivalry at the geopolitical stage between the United States and China means for European security. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Heather Conley from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she is the Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and I might add the Arctic, something that might come up in the discussions. And before that, you were also Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau for European and Eurasian Affairs, and you were responsible for relations with a number of European countries. So I think you know our sensitivities and our concerns over here in Europe very well. Thank you very much for joining us. Professor Andrei Kortunov is the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council, an eminent Russian think tank on international relations, who has authored an enormous slew of publications, I think over 120 now, on Russian US and Soviet US relations, on global security and on foreign and domestic uh, politics and policy of the United States or of the, of the Russian Federation. And if anyone can tell us a little bit how on your side from Moscow you're looking at some of these questions, then it's you. Professor, so thank you very much for being with us. And last but not least, our very own Dick Sunday, who is the head of the security unit here at the Klingendal Institute, uh, who has a long and distinguished career with NATO, with the European Union, with the Netherlands Defense Ministry, and who is also a member of the Peace and Security Committee of the Dutch Advisory Council on International Affairs, and as such, helped to author a rather groundbreaking piece of advice to the Dutch government that I hope that we can touch on a little bit later. Now, uh, and my name is Bob Dane, and I have the honor of being the coordinator of the Klingendal Russia and Eastern Europe Center and to moderate today's discussion. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. As you see, we have divided up our audience, unfortunately, into two parts, a part that is with us in the Zoom call. Uh, that audience can actually ask us questions that we'll pick up during the Q&A. It is already open now, so you can type your questions in there. And then after our initial introductions, I will pick up the questions and distribute them uh, to the panel. So please make use of that. And I think you can now even vote on each other's questions. So if you see a good question from someone else, you can vote it and it goes higher and higher up in my list until I can eventually no longer ignore it. So please make use of that option. Those of you who are with us on YouTube, unfortunately, you cannot participate in the debate, but you have the advantage you can watch this anytime you want. So if you want to be in the live discussion, then register on our website and next time we can have you with us in the Zoom. So that is it from my side. I'd like to move into the first part of the discussion. We're starting really at the, the geopolitical level and then we're moving down more to the European security questions. And we end up with very specific, something that concerns us in the immediate term, which is arms control and in particular, the New START Treaty. So these are the topics on the, on the menu. But uh, Mrs. Connolly or Heather, if you permit me, the first question I, I just have to ask you, which is that it's been a very rocky ride for all of us, for you in the US, uh, for us here in Europe, the, the Trump administration and some of its actions, including troop withdrawals from Germany announced, questioning the role of NATO, withdrawal from multilateralism. And of course, that begs the question, with the elections coming up, how much will it mean for us, depending on which candidate wins? Because we have a tendency to want to think that everything will go back to normal if President Biden would win the elections. Uh, and we have a, a tendency to predict doom and gloom if not. But these are larger trends, the pivot to Asia and, and, uh, and things like that started well before President Trump. So could you give us a little bit of a, of a glance into the future without going into forecasts on who might win, on what it is we can expect in terms of European security on a, in a Biden or a Trump administration? Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great privilege to be with you and to join with Andre and Dick for a really important discussion. Thank you so much. Well, I think as your, your question really captured the fact that 
the U.S. security commitment to Europe has been waning really since the early 2000s, really after the conflict in the Western Balkans. The U.S. rapidly reoriented, obviously, to the Middle East, Afghanistan, then Iraq, uh, and then more recently to the Indo-Pacific region. So this has been certainly a, a long-term trend. And it's very true, there is a bipartisan sense of frustration that Europe has not made a more meaningful contribution to its own defense spending. Uh, and that, again, that's a, that's a bipartisan issue. There's also a very strong bipartisan sense that China is uh, the United States' main strategic concern. Um, however, uh, there's not an agreed to path about how to uh, manage that long-term challenge. But I will say events, uh, as Harold McMillan would say, events, my dear boy, events have, mm -hmm. have shaped the U.S. response to Europe. And it's been really events related to Russia. Clearly, the annexation of Crimea and the incursion into Donbass re-enlivened. I mean, it was 2014 that the U.S. was withdrawing major combat components out of Europe, and they then began to return them uh, back to that point. So now the U.S. is certainly much more involved in European security um, with the forces uh, in Poland and, and elsewhere, Syria, Russia's moves in Syria, and I would even argue the Arctic um, and recent events with the poisoning of Alexei Navalny and events in Belarus have just reminded us why it's important that the U.S. had to be very engaged uh, in Europe. So why did President Trump decide to withdraw 12,000 forces if that was the case? This is election politics. This is about meeting President Trump's campaign promise of bringing U.S. forces home. So that is the decision in Afghanistan, the troop uh, down, uh, drawdown, the announcement yesterday on Iraq. The German decision fits into that, although there is a very strong you know, anti-German perspective from President Trump that's very clear. I wouldn't be surprised if more uh, additional um, forces are withdrawn, uh, but that's campaign promises. You're right, the election outcome will have significant uh, implications. Vice President Biden believes in, a, in an allied approach to our foreign challenges, uh, and he believes in multilateralism. The president, as clearly stated, believes in America first, a unilateral approach uh, that is not collaborative in any stretch or form. But I will leave you with an optimistic note, because we have to be optimistic these days, because the challenges are so great, um, that even though President Trump has profoundly broken trust and credibility with our allies in Europe or uh, in Asia, what the U.S. military has tried to do is be the ballast for, for, for this, uh, this uncertainty. And so what you're seeing is a, an attempt to strengthen U.S. military intelligence relations with our closest partners to try to manage this unevenness. But I think we're now seeing with the German decision, even that is really coming uh, to, to its end. So huge challenges. Europe really must do more for its defense spending, even if Vice President Biden uh, is uh, is the winner in November. Okay, thank you very much also for that, that clear signal that these trends are moving regardless of the specific elections, but we can expect big differences in not only nuance, but in, in general philosophy, if you will, towards multilateralism and towards working with allies. And thank you very much for that, for that summary. And then Professor Kartunov, the, the Russian Federation has long made it clear that it doesn't feel particularly comfortable in a unipolar world with, led by the United States. And that it, it also didn't really get the restoration of relations with the United States that it might have hoped for after President Trump was elected. Now, it does seem that the world is moving away from unipolarity, but maybe not in the direction that Russia would like. It might even become a more bipolar world with the US and China as the main adversaries. And then Europe and Russia find themselves wedged in between these two giants. Now, could you for us lift a little bit the veil on the thinking in Moscow on this, on how the Russia sees this new world order emerging and what place it would like to have in there? Well, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to participate uh, in this event. Uh, uh, it's a big question, of course. Uh, we have the official line, uh, which uh, implies that Russia stands uh, for multipolarity. 
uh, though I think that uh, sometimes uh, there is no clarity of what this multipolarity means and whether mm -hmm. Russia itself can claim to be one of the poles in this multipolar world. Uh, but uh, watching uh, the developments uh, today, of course, uh, in Moscow, they uh, also take notice that uh, the world uh, is likely to move in the direction of bipolarity rather than multipolarity. And uh, China and the United States uh, stand out as the two major poles uh, for now and uh, probably for the foreseeable future. Uh, I think that uh, definitely there are some people uh, in Moscow who would find uh, these development positive. Uh, it is clearly better than uh, potential G2 model or chimerica, uh, which would uh, make uh, Russia marginalized in the international system. However, as far as I'm concerned, I think that uh, bipolarity is clearly not uh, in the interests of the Russian Federation, at least not in the long term interests of the Russian Federation. It's true that Russia might uh, become more important uh, for China uh, in this environment but uh, uh, the side effects will also be quite significant. Uh, first of all, uh, in this world, uh, the existing asymmetry between the Russian and uh, the Chinese potential uh, will be more explicit. Uh, and uh, the Russian dependence on China is likely to grow, which is not necessarily a good thing uh, for Moscow. Uh, second, uh, and this is uh, also something related uh, uh, to this asymmetry, is that uh, Moscow in this uh, rigid bipolar structure is likely to, to lose its freedom of maneuver. It would be very difficult, for example, to maintain uh, good relations with India. And these relations are important for Moscow. It would be difficult to balance uh, relations uh, with China and relations with Vietnam or even with Japan. Uh, both countries uh, are important uh, for Moscow and uh, their importance might grow uh, in the foreseeable future. But uh, let me conclude with saying that, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, the choice that Russia really faces is not a choice uh, between the West and the East, uh, or between China and the United States. The choice is rather about uh, self-isolation and integration. Uh, and I think uh, this is a critical uh, issue for the Russian Federation. Unfortunately, for the time being, I think we are moving uh, in the direction of isolation or self-isolation. Uh, I think that uh, it uh, might uh, uh, be uh, 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 something that uh, certain people in Moscow might like, but the country at large uh, is not likely to win uh, in this uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, situation of self-isolation. I think that integrationism uh, is the only future, and I would emphasize not exactly multipolarity, uh, but uh, uh, rather multilateralism, which Russia yet uh, has to learn. Okay, thank you, because that tension that we sometimes see between those in Russia who want to integrate more or open more doors and those that are going into the, what's the word, besieged fortress, the Asociación Crepest question. And I think that is something that also recent events, including Navalny, keep pushing into that direction of isolation and that's certainly something that I would imagine could be of concern to those that wanted more open doors. Maybe a quick follow-up question because you prompted it by mentioning India. I've just noticed that, that China joined the Kafka's 2020 military exercises that India was particularly unhappy about that and withdrew. So as Russia tries to maintain these good relations with the different actors it seems that for now China wins the day is, is, or is that too soon uh, to already come to such conclusions? Well, the trend is there, but of course, uh, it is still uh, only a trend. Uh, if you take the specific issue of India, uh, the uh, formal uh, reason for not taking part in the exercise was the situation with the pandemic in India. Mm -hmm. uh, they said that, uh, sorry, but uh, under the current circumstances, we simply cannot do it. And I would also add that uh, Indians uh, have uh, proposed to have a separate exercises in the Bay mm -hmm. of Bengal as a kind of compensation uh -huh. uh, for, okay. uh, for their decision not to take part in the Kafkas exercises. I think that uh, the ties between India and Russia are very strong and uh, it's not easy to disrupt these ties. But definitely, if you look, uh, for example, at the scale of economic relations, uh, India is clearly lagging behind uh, China quite significantly. So I would call if I were to compare relations uh, with India and with Russia, I would say that the relations with India that Russia has today uh, is like a, an ideal marriage without kids. <laughs> okay. and, uh, 
and the relations with China are like a wild affair uh, without a marriage contract. So okay. <laughs> it's I a think, question what is better. <laughs> I think we just have the quote of the day from the webinar. Thank you very much, Professor. If I can move to you, Mr. Zande, on this question on European responsibility for its own security. That is, has been sort of running through your career and through your writings. You've been long arguing that we should take much more responsibility ourselves and that we should also cooperate more with each other as Europeans, as European Union in the field of defense and security. Um, and that was also a centerpiece of that advice of the international, the Dutch International Advisory Affairs Council. Now, could you tell us a little bit from your perspective then, what is it we as Europeans should be defending ourselves against in light of what Heather told us, uh, the expectation from the United States that we take more responsibility? in light of that deteriorating geopolitical climate? And what do you think are then the main steps that are important for us to take in the coming years? Floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. And I feel honored to be in a panel with such distinguished speakers like uh, Andre and, and Heather. Uh, let me say a few things on the threats and challenges and on the potential steps that, that can be taken. Noticing, of course, that you cannot compare Europe with either Russia, China, or the United States. Uh, there, is, there is no united Europe. There is no Europe as a superpower uh, or a world power at this moment. Um, I mean, the, the question of threats and challenges is relatively easy. Right? It's the arc of instability that is stretching from Murmansk in the far north through the Middle East and Africa to the western point of, uh, of, of northern Africa. Uh, and we have different sorts of threats stemming from that. So in the north is more traditional military and hybrid threats, and the further you go south, it's regional instability and the uh, spillover effects like uh, terrorism, uh, migration, refugee flows, uh, big international criminal networks operating uh, inside Europe, but having their bases there and so forth. Um, so, I mean, the threat picture, I think, is not uh, uh, the issue. Uh, the question indeed is what can Europe do uh, in response to all those challenges were so complicated and involved so many state and even non-state actors. Uh, and that is, of course, is the more difficult uh, uh, one. Um, I think it's for the first thing, the first remark would be that it's clear that Europe has woken up. Uh, the former NATO Secretary General Yabdo Sefer called that at uh, the end of a strategic holiday. Uh, I think with the Crimea, with ISIS and with many other things that happened over the last few years. Uh, the tweets from the White House uh, and the Chinese economic intrusion into Europe, uh, it is quite clear that this strategic holiday is over, definitely. Um, so, in other words, Europe simply has no other choice than to become a player on the world uh, stage, leaving to the side the question if that is feasible in the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, if it will not attempt to do that, it will become irrelevant uh, and will be open to even more influence from uh, outside. Um, the problem is that we have, in theory, we have it all nicely in place in Europe. Eh? The EU Global Strategy of 2014 has written it down quite nicely. Uh, but the problem of Europe, is to, of Europe is to turning the words into action, into deeds. And this is where Europe's weaknesses come uh, in. Uh, there's na national fragmentation with a wide variety of key security interests leading to different priorities in foreign policy and security policy uh, and in defense. And we see that in particularly, of course, between the East uh, and the south uh, of Europe. And as a result of that divergence landscape uh, in, in Europe, it becomes almost impossible today to agree either in the EU uh, or in NATO on what to do in times of crisis and in what to invest, what are your priorities in terms of diplomacy uh, and defense. And as a result, we see NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, basically being day after day busy with keeping their own club together instead of doing something strategically in foreign policy uh, in being an actor on the world uh, uh, stage. And I, I'm afraid that these non-attractive conditions for Europe uh, will be there in the future uh, as well, at least in the foreseeable future. Furthermore, as we have seen in the last few years, both organizations have increasingly to deal with obstinate members in its own club. Um, challenging the foundations of the multilateral system of the organization itself. And the latest example, of course, is, is Turkey. So what is then left? Your second question, Bob, uh, of the steps that can be taken by uh, Europe. And I want to make three short points to finish this introduction. First, build and expand on what can be done and not on theoretical concepts. 
Uh, this brings in a bit the debate about strategic autonomy of Europe. I think we have to be realistic politically and militarily. Europe cannot do everything. It will have to make choices where it can do something, where it can act and where it has the capabilities. So in other words, it has to be selective in addressing uh, world politics, world issues. Northern Africa comes to my mind as something Europe should be capable to handle of. Two, we have to work more in Europe, I believe, with core groups and not necessarily all together. Uh, these diverging strategic interests across Europe can only be overcome by operating in smaller groups. Uh, but at least one larger nation in it, preferably more, but at least one. And there are many examples of this already. Uh, we have uh, France and Germany taking the lead uh, in the Minsk uh, process. Uh, we have France that uh, was a sort of a lead nation in the Mali intervention, uh, and London and Paris working together uh, when the Libya intervention took place. So um, these core groups, I think, is for the moment the solution to have a European role uh, uh, on the world uh, stage. Third and last point, uh, we have to use all the tools that we have available in Europe. And here, Europe is quite rich, I would say. Uh, we are perhaps a bit weak militarily, but we're very strong in economic and financial terms. We are strong in terms of diplomacy. We're strong in other areas as well. So to combine these tools, that, of course, will remain the big challenge. That's the well-known theory of the comprehensive approach, approach, but I don't think we have been extremely successful in, in that. And we cannot create stability uh, and peace forever in Northern Africa if we don't apply all these tools uh, together. And to the east, to Russia, uh, I, I would say that we have to defend our European interests. We should also have the door open for dialogue. And where we do have common interests with Russia, and perhaps even with China, I think about climate, counterterrorism, uh, we should continue to work uh, together. So in conclusion, in the great power competition, I believe that Europe should be strategically autonomous when and where possible. Uh, and it should not aim for confrontation, but for defending its own strategic interest while cooperating as much as possible on issues where cooperation is possible. Okay, thank you very much, Dick. So in a way, it is also accepting that fragmentation in Europe and not trying to always try to do everything together and that, of course, sets Europe apart from these other three major actors on the world stage. We're not a unitary actor. We argue so much amongst ourselves. Recent decisions on Belarus being a case in point, or non-decisions, in fact. Uh, but I think this point about you know, working with smaller groups and then moving forward where you can find that consensus might be the most uh, pragmatic one. But of course, there is this broader question of European defense cooperation, of putting our own house in order, of strengthening our own military. And in a way, Heather, there I come to you because the message that we get from the United States is sometimes, at least appears to me, a bit ambiguous. You want us to do more, you want us to spend more, but the moment we start working together with the European defense industries and try to produce our own things or to strengthen our own cooperation, then we get warnings coming from not only the Trump administration, also previous administrations telling us, don't delink, you know, keep the link with the US, don't discriminate us, we want to have equal access to your market, and especially don't duplicate with NATO. Now, what is it, and I'm sorry to have to ask you this, but what is it the US really expects from us when it comes to taking responsibility for our own security? Thank you. Well, Bob, again, you, you captured it absolutely correctly. It's not ambiguous, it's contradictory. Uh, and this has always been the challenge uh, with US leadership. Uh, but let me just pull back for a moment, just to speak mm -hmm. a little bit about sort of the trends that we need to start moving to. I mean, the United okay. States needs to reassess and regain its strategic understanding of allies and our commitment to them and their role in US strategy. Our national security strategy and national defense strategy place allies as a central pillar in meeting our global challenges. Yet our tactical activities absolutely undercut that. So we have to rethink that. And, and to be honest with you, our, the al allies are America's greatest strength, but we have to manage that so much better. And this gets to your point of, well, we don't manage it very well because we have sort of two speeds. One is we're in charge, we're telling you what to do, uh, we're bringing a lot of forces to bear, and we just want everyone to drop their national caveats and do what we say. That's sort of one mode. The other mode is we're out, you've got this, we're busy and don't bother us. And that doesn't work either. We, what yeah. we need to construct is a, a path forward where we allow those core nations to lead 
in certain areas, but the U.S. supports with enablers. Uh, we, we know we're essential for our European allies to be able to commit resources and project power. So we have to agree this together, but we, the United States has to accept that our allies may do things very differently operationally. Our leaders have to be able to understand their role in a support function. The Mali example, the U.S. is providing enormous amounts of support for, for French forces and multilateral forces in the Sahel. The problem gets back to this, uh, what's the U.S. deciding on a daily basis? And this has been, you know, the withdrawal, whether it's from Afghanistan or Iraq, or even potentially withdrawing forces in our AFRICOM theater, that leaves our allies completely unable to continue their own military mission. So this is the mutuality that is essential to maintain. We just have to define our roles and make a long-term commitment and consistency to policy approaches, and that's what's profoundly broken down. Mm -hmm. And maybe also to be a bit more fair to you, because it sounds a little bit accusatory, I'm, I'm sure that you also sometimes get very frustrated with having to speak to Europe and then hearing all these different positions and, all, and, and sort of, it is, you don't even have to play us out against each other, we do that happily ourselves. Right? I mean, that is the, uh, the big tragedy, if you will, of the ultimate, this question of when I want to speak to Europe, who do I, who do I call? But is there something we could do, we being here, not mostly the EU actually, something we could do to keep that sort of transatlantic link going? Because sometimes it feels that we're just in waiting mode and, and waiting to see what happens in November. Uh, but are there things that you feel Europe needs to hear coming from the US, what we could do on our side? Yeah, I think my frustration, and I think Dick captured this really well in, in his framing comments, because to, to my mind, uh, the EU is very strong on rhetoric and white papers and they fall very flat on actually doing what they keep telling us that they want to do. I mean, there's some exceptions to this in some of the joint procurements with Eurodrone and things like that. I mean, we hear PESCO, we hear all of these things. So there's lots of process, but there's very little outcome. And so what we need to do, I think, is work with communities, clusters of countries that where we share the threat perception and there is a political willingness to use uh, defense and security capabilities. We have an agreed assessment and then we just go do it and we grow it. Stop with the talking, let's start doing. And so I think what we're seeing in some ways is a regionalization, a framework nation uh, concept playing out on the Eastern flank. It's playing out in the North Atlantic with the United States, UK and Norway taking a much greater leadership role uh, in the North Atlantic. I think the French are taking a greater role in the Mediterranean. We're starting to see that regionalization. And I think it's just the pragmatism of we have to have these capabilities if we want to ensure and enhance our security. So I think it's now time to start doing fewer paper writing and processes, more procurement, more engagement. And you're absolutely right. The US can, at the one hand, say do more and then undercut what Europe's doing. We need to support what Europe's doing and make sure we have a shared approach so we're not duplicating uh, unnecessarily or competing. That is silly. Resources are too scarce. OK, thanks a lot. That is well noted for us. And I think many of us on this side of the, of the Atlantic do agree fully with that, with that point. But then, Professor Kortunov, this brings me to you because Often within these debates within Europe, Russia is cited as one of the main reasons why we need to do more on defense, why we need to invest more. Uh, and we've already, Dick mentioned Crimea, that was really a moment when Europe indeed did wake up and thought, okay, there is a, uh, you know, it's not all new threats. There is also still uh, the question of what Heather just called the East, Eastern Front. Uh, but here, maybe looking at it from Moscow, I, sometimes Russian colleagues tell me that no, but we feel threatened by you. Uh, we almost feel like we're caught in a classic security dilemma. So as NATO strengthens its own military presence in Europe, so does Russia, and it, we get caught into an escalating buildup. Um, and you said in the past that uh, there are still, and I quote you, opportunities on common ground on security between Russia and the European Union. These are limited, but they are still broader than those between Russia and NATO. Now, if I could take you up on that, in the absence of a direct and, and constructive dialogue with Washington, are there steps that Russia and European states could take to restore a little bit of confidence in that acrimonious relationship? Are there some security issues we can cooperate on despite our differences? Well, uh, first of all, let me make a kind of uh, 
uh, side topic. Uh, when I looked at the ad uh, for this event, uh, and uh, it represents four flags, mm. uh, I noticed that uh, the European Union flag is the smallest, <laughs> which I think is not fair for Europeans. And uh, clearly, when we look uh, uh, at Brussels from Moscow, the European Union still remains uh, by far uh, the largest trading partner of the Russian Federation, uh, the major source of investments, uh, and uh, also uh, the best uh, source of uh, social and corporate practices. And by the way, the Netherlands uh, uh, is very uh, significantly engaged uh, in the Russian Federation, even now, even with all the sanctions notwithstanding. Uh, for example, I'm not sure that uh, Russia uh, could uh, have been so successful in its agriculture uh, without a major, major assistance uh, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, speaking of the security dimension, uh, I am, unfortunately, I'm not too optimistic about uh, NATO. The NATO Russian Council is half paralyzed and uh, I'm afraid the situation is not likely to change anytime soon, especially in view of the most recent developments. Uh, but uh, if you take Russia and uh, the European Union, uh, you'll see that on certain issues, uh, the positions of the two sides overlap or even coincide. Uh, uh, for example, uh, we are much closer with each other than we are with Washington DC uh, on the Iranian nuclear problem. Uh, we are much closer with the, to each other uh, on issues of the uh, Middle East peace settlement. Uh, even uh, on Libya, I would say uh, there are opportunities for broader uh, cooperation with the European Union, though, of course, uh, there are different positions uh, and different expectations uh, uh, of uh, the results of the Syrian conflict. But I have to say that even within the European Union, as we know, there are uh, very different views on, uh, on Libya and uh, how this conflict uh, can and should be resolved. So I would uh, probably single out uh, the out of area problems as uh, uh, one of uh, uh, potential uh, opportunities uh, for cooperation in the security domain uh, between Russia and the European Union. I would also argue that uh, uh, there are uh, probably untapped uh, opportunities uh, uh, in uh, working on uh, uh, soft security issues uh, or on issues which uh, belong to, I would say, non-conventional security challenges that uh, both sides face. Uh, uh, you take, uh, for example, terrorism, uh, you take uh, uh, jihadists uh, who get back uh, uh, to their home countries. Definitely some uh, cooperation between uh, Russia and the European Union uh, would be uh, in the interest uh, of uh, both sides. Uh, uh, a lot will depend uh, on how far the European Union is ready to go in its own security uh, uh, strategy. To what extent uh, Russia can consider the Union uh, to be a full-fledged partner, uh, given the fact that, uh, uh, of course, it, as it has been mentioned uh, before, uh, the strategic autonomy of the European Union uh, is still, uh, uh, to a large extent, a dream. And uh, we still don't know uh, uh, whether it is going to be something more practical. But uh, as I mentioned, and let me emphasize it, I think that uh, uh, in certain ways uh, uh, it is easier to work with the European Union than with NATO, though in some other areas uh, the United States uh, is still indispensable. Uh, you mm -hmm. cannot work with Europe uh, without uh, going to Washington DC, and this is something which is well understood in Moscow. Yeah, yeah, noted. And we'll come to indeed, um, especially with arms control, that seems to be the case. But there's one topic that actually Heather has in her job title and Dick has just published on, and I know you also know a lot about, and that is the Arctic. Uh, and maybe, uh, Dick, if you could tell us a little bit more on the risks of the, the high north or the Arctic becoming a new area of geopolitical confrontation, uh, where Europe is not always entirely in the driver's seat. I think Heather mentioned also this framework nations concept. Are there things that we can do to avoid the Arctic from becoming yet another area of confrontation um, between Russia, Europe, and maybe even China? Yeah, the floor is yours. Just, just unmute myself. Yeah, um, no, yeah I mean, I mentioned climate change already eh, in my uh, initial uh, remarks that that might be in, uh, a topic to, uh, to uh, cooperate uh, with uh, Russia and, and, and also with China and with the other uh, countries in the world. 
Uh, and the Arctic is partly about climate change huh? because the fact that it is uh, step by step becoming an area of great power competition, of course, is directly related to the melting of the ice uh, in, in that area. Um, fortunately, I think we still have something there in place with, which works. Uh, all the Arctic countries, eight of them in total, including Russia, uh, the United States, uh, are cooperating in the Arctic Council uh, and that it's still working pretty well. Uh, the danger is developments outside the framework of the uh, Arctic Council. The Arctic Council is by mandate not allowed to address military issues. So it deals about economic and, and environmental issues and uh, things like that. Uh, the danger is that outside the cooperative, the framework we have at the moment, something is step by step developing, which is threatening the Arctic cooperation. That is where I have my concerns, which was written down in the report we published indeed earlier this year. And we think should, something should be done about it. Uh, what we have to do is this, primarily, of course, the Arctic countries, but others could play a supportive role in there, to uh, start negotiating a new set of rules, conflict prevention type of rules. In the old days, we used to call them confidence and security building measures. Perhaps we need a new term today. Uh, but to reduce risk and to reduce in crisis situation that it might escalate very quickly to something uh, worse to happen. Uh, and that is perhaps an area where Europe can play a role in the Arctic countries in particular, of course, and Russia can also play a very positive role because Russia has a clear interest here. It has the largest Arctic coast, uh, thousands of kilometers long, and it wants to have a stable environment there for economic purposes. Uh, and therefore, uh, agreeing with all the countries around the North, uh, uh, the Arctic area on such a set of rules is also in the interest of Russia. Thank you very much. And I would like to follow up on the Arctic, but I think my time is running out because the audience is starting to type their questions and some of them are indeed very good and I want to make sure they get asked. So I'll just move to the last part of our uh, pre-planned discussion on arms control. And now I invite everyone to type your questions in the Zoom so I can give you the floor in a bit, late, uh, in a bit later. Uh, Heather, the last one for you is on um, nuclear um, negotiations, basically on the new uh, start treaty. And we understand that for a long time for the US this hinged on Chinese participation. And of course, in a way that makes sense, right? If two nuclear powers have to limit their arsenals, but everybody else can build as much as they want, uh, it could disbalance the world. But if you look at the absolute numbers of warheads that we talk about, maybe it wasn't the, the key driver on why these talks wouldn't work out. And then if we looked at it uh, over August, maybe with really hopeful, with the I thought we detected a little bit of a hint from the US that maybe this Chinese participation is not absolutely essential. Could you give us your view on the current thinking in Washington on that so crucial treaty for us here in Europe uh, on the New START Treaty? Thank you. Well, I think it is true that uh, China does need to begin to be a more active participant in the arms control uh, universe uh, because of our own concerns about uh, the transparency and, and developments. But uh, the reason the U.S. has softened its position is because the Chinese have absolutely refused to participate in those uh, conversations. You can put their flag there and you can embarrass them that there's an empty chair, but they weren't coming. So I think this is more the U.S. acknowledging uh, that it was unable to force China to the table. It even asked Russia to try to help force China to the table, and it just didn't work. Um, so I think now you do see a more concerted effort um, bilaterally with Russia. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a variety of motivations behind this. Um, and as I said, if there's one thing I've, I've tried to grow my skill set in Washington over the last three and a half years is dealing with a lot of contradictory pieces of information and trying to put those pieces together and see if they make yeah. sense. Many times they just contradictory and they don't make sense. So the president noted the other week that he said that the, the US Russian bilateral uh, talks were going well. Uh, he, he suggested that they were negotiating a new non-proliferation uh, treaty or a new arms, a new arms control agreement, and that it would be. Secretary Pompeo said it would be finished by the end of this year. Uh, Marshall Billingsley, who is the special, the U.S. special envoy for these uh, talks has suggested that we will extend a uh, new start, uh, but with caveats that there will be some new elements uh, that must be agreed to before that extension happens. And of course, Minister Lavrov just said, 
none of these uh, conditions are acceptable to Russia. So that's, I think, where we are. Andre may have a, a better sense uh, from the Russia side. What in part is driving some of this, I believe, this is my own interpretation, President Trump very much wants to have a meeting with President Putin before the election, potentially. Now that I think waxes and wanes a little bit. And of course, arms control uh, and signing an extension of New START would fit into that. A reason that the president wants to have a positive relationship with Russia because of the nuclear question. So mm -hmm. that would fit into an election strategy. Uh, but again, I think the sides are likely far apart, not on the extension, perhaps, but the conditionality of that extension. And quite frankly, we do have to wait, I think, into, until the election, because yeah. if uh, Vice President Biden is elected, he has signaled that he would extend New START. There may be some conditionalities to that as well. I don't know. But as I said, I think this may get caught up a little bit in election politics. But the most important thing here is just to pull back again. The arms control architecture that was painfully built over decades is now nearly gone. I mean, it is almost gone now with Open Skies Treaty with the US withdrawal. We have to urgently rebuild a new arms control architecture that yes, incorporates China into it eventually, but deals with new weapon systems that are coming online, uh, space. It needs to deal with a wide, wide variety of issues that we have allowed to sort of atrophy for far too long. So this is a moment of despair for the arms control community because this architecture is, is, is now almost completely uh, gone. But I think there is great opportunity for flexibility, for new approaches, new dialogue to embrace new technologies and new systems that are now fundamentally changing arms control. And Russia mm -hmm. itself is very much, I think, thinking through its doctrine, at least talking about its, its doctrin doctrinal approach here. We really need to have this dialogue. It's really, really urgent. Well, Andre, then it comes logically to you. And when we were preparing this debate, you told me actually there is almost no arms control left. So what is there to discuss? Now, and maybe we should indeed discuss what Heather just said, the urgency of the entire system crumbling and New START being one of the last vestiges remaining of the, the old arms control systems, if you will. And I can imagine that also some in Moscow might not be too keen to engage in yet another super expensive uh, arms race at a time when all our budgets are under stretch, but yours are also affected by lower oil prices, by COVID. So is there still some glimmer of hope in also what you've just heard from Heather? Are there opportunities to rebuild or reconstruct some of the arms control agreements uh, according to Moscow? Well, uh, first let me say that uh... Uh, I agree with Heather, and I always agree with her, uh, and definitely we have a problem. We have a crisis, uh, and no matter uh, whether the new start uh, is uh, extended or not, uh, definitely we are coming to the end uh, of the existing arms control model. It will be a bumpy road, and uh, I'm afraid that uh, one of the issues that we have here is that uh, leaders all over the place, including the United States and uh, the Russian Federation do not put arms control on top of the uh, political agendas. And I think that we experts and, uh, uh, and the public at large uh, should take a part of responsibility for that uh, because we do not promote the ideas of arms control. And people uh, get more information uh, about uh, how to limit plastic bags rather than how to limit uh, nuclear warheads. And uh, I understand that plastic bags are an important problem, but uh, I think that there is still place uh, uh, for the uh, nuclear arms uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the public consciousness. Uh, I agree with uh, Heather that uh, we should uh, think creatively uh, uh, about a new architecture or about a new arms control ecosystem. Uh, and uh, clear enough that it will be very different from what we have right now. Uh, it will be more about uh, quantity rather than about quality. It will be about space and uh, uh, autonomous lethal systems and cyber and artificial intelligence. And I think no one really knows uh, how to deal with these issues. Uh, uh, it will be uh, probably less uh, based uh, uh, on uh, uh, legally binding agreements. I don't believe that we will have many of these agreements anytime soon. Uh, but uh, probably some voluntary matters, uh, measures, uh, maybe uh, some parallel uh, actions uh, by nuclear powers can, can do a trick. Uh, and uh, uh, it is also uh, clear uh, that uh, uh, we should 
probably talk about arms management rather than mm -hmm. arms control in the classical sense of the word. As far as Russia is concerned, uh, I'm afraid that right now we are moving in the direction of what I would call nuclear isolationism. And uh, President Putin is quite clear on that. Uh, he says that no matter what other nation states are doing, we will make sure that we will have our deterrent potential ready. And under certain circumstances, we can even use uh, our nuclear uh, weapons first uh, if we feel that the existence of our state is under threat. Uh, so I think that it is a problem. But in order to address this problem, uh, we need a different level of political relations uh, between Russia, the United States, China, and maybe other uh, nuclear countries. Uh, it will be a pain-taking effort. Uh, we should probably focus on something which is more apparent, for example, on non-proliferation issues, how to prevent proliferation, how to deal uh, with the threat of nuclear terrorism, and gradually, very slowly, building trust and building some confidence, uh, we can uh, get uh, back to more rigid, more formal, uh, maybe even to legally binding agreements. We will have to cross what I would call a death zone. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be a bumpy road, at least a couple of years. But if we don't start moving right now, uh, I think we will not get there. OK. Thank you very much, Professor. And also your point about keeping it on the agenda is crucial. Now, as a modest as we are at the Klingendal Institute, of course, we try to do that. And for those of you watching on the 18th of September, uh, not long from now, eight days from now, we're bringing together Thomas Countryman from the Arms Control Association, Sergei Batsanov, probably not unknown to you, um, Andre of Pugwash, and our own Sikov van der Meer for a webinar specifically on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty on the Review Conference. So. I will park arms control here for now, if you permit, because there are some questions in, uh, from the audience that I really want to ask. And one of the uh, participants has asked two questions, Neil, uh, and they're both excellent. Now, Neil, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you the chance to, answer, to ask one of the two questions. So the choice is yours, but they're both excellent, so I wish we had time for both. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, Neil. Thank you very much, and hello to everybody. Um, I'll perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll go to the first question, because I think you perhaps sure. all, the, all the, everyone might want to come in on that, and that is really this question about, I mean, we've had a series of efforts to have resets, which have normally had the West as the demandeur, which have all failed, most recently, of course, President Macron's. Andre's comments got me thinking about, could we actually begin to see an opportunity where Russia is a demandeur for a reset, because it's room for maneuver is increasingly restricted in the Indo-Pacific as a result of the rise of the, of the China-US uh, bilateral competition. And since Russia has used the Indo-Pacific relationships as a counterbalance to, to the West since 2014, does this mean that Russia might start to look for new openings and, and a new dialogue with the West? So then my second question is, then what would Russia realistically offer? And, and I mean by this, of course, we can do confidence building measures and some of the softer security things that Andre mentioned, but ultimately we have to get down to the hard security questions and the red lines which, which the West feel have been violated. So would Russia be willing to move in any of those areas or what might they be? Thank you, Neil. Professor Kortonov. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, I'm uh, very concerned about the most recent developments, uh, namely, about the events in Belarus, and uh, Russia seems uh, uh, to harden its position, initial position in Belarus, uh, which is not exactly a good sign for uh, the future of the relations between Russia and Europe. And of course, uh, this atrocious crime, uh, uh, you know, this uh, poisoning of Navalny. Uh, and again, this is something uh, which uh, does not allow me to be too optimistic about uh, any reset in the immediate uh, future. Uh, we know that uh, uh, they still uh, working on the timing of President Macron's trip to Moscow, uh, and uh, uh, French uh, have just postponed uh, the uh, uh, two plus two meeting between foreign and defense ministries. Uh, so uh, there are issues. Uh, and uh, I keep asking myself uh, why Russia is not moving faster. Uh, because six months ago, when the pandemic started, I thought that that was probably the moment of truth. And this is something that would, should allow all of us uh, to put uh, our disagreements uh, aside uh, and uh, to start working uh, together. Uh, there are many reasons why Russia is not as active as some of us uh, would like it to be. I'm thinking about institutional inertia, for example. 
I'm thinking about uh, uh, a concern in Russia that its flexibility might be interpreted as a weakness and uh, might be used to exercise more pressure on the Kremlin. Uh, it uh, uh, might be also an expectation that the West uh, uh, will come out of this crisis relatively weaker uh, than Russia and China, and that would allow uh, the non-Western countries to exercise more power. But uh, responding to this uh, issue, what Russia can do, uh, I think that, uh, and this is my first, uh, uh, my, my first uh, guess is that uh, Russia could probably demonstrate more flexibility uh, on the Ukrainian issue because Ukraine remains the major problem which uh, uh, divides Russia and the West. Uh, I, uh, I try to be realistic. I don't think that uh, Russia can, uh, uh, will be willing, the Russian leadership will be willing to discuss Crimea right away. Uh, but uh, in terms of the modality of the Minsk agreements implementation, uh, I would personally recommend uh, 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 the Kremlin uh, to exercise a little bit more flexibility, given the fact that uh, uh, the Ukrainian side is uh, not uh, capable of implementing these agreements in full. So I think uh, this is something that we should keep in mind. Uh, second, I would get back uh, to the out of area issues. I think that uh, Russia could uh, probably exercise somewhat more pressure on Assad in Syria, uh, especially on the issue of detainees uh, and uh, uh, refugees coming back to Syria. And uh, I hope that that could be appreciated uh, in the European Union. But uh, I don't think that there is any magic solution. So for me, the most important thing right now is uh, to resume full-fledged uh, uh, communication lines uh, with the European Union and to work on relatively smaller issues uh, like uh, the green agenda of the European Union uh, on uh, 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 5G, uh, uh, on uh, uh, maybe a, a sub-regional cooperation opportunities. Uh, but again, let me conclude uh, uh, to state that I'm very concerned uh, about the most recent development, and I'm afraid that we might be sliding uh, to a new uh, crisis uh, in the relations, not just with the United States, but with the European Union as well. Uh, thank you. And also by saying that you've answered one of the questions or comments that one of my colleagues Hugo made just in the chat that if we don't invest in the Ukraine crisis, which seems to slip off the agenda, despite its in enormous importance on Russia, Europe, US relations, if then uh, Hugo's point is that then strategic conversations don't get you very far because you still have this deeper uh, stalemate with Ukraine at its center. So thank you very much, um, Andre, for that. I would like to now give the floor to Martijn, who has a question uh, on the consequences of Brexit. Martijn, the floor is yours. Very actual at the moment, I might add, Martijn, given everything that's going on um, uh, in the parliamentary debates there. Yes. Um, hello, and um, thank you for having me. Um, okay. Well, as, as stated, uh, Europe is in need of its own common defense policy outside or alongside NATO, since that organization offers no longer a well, full guarantee of security. However, uh, with Great Britain as a military and also a nuclear power set to leave the Union next year, um, how can independent or semi-independent uh, military security in Europe be achieved? Um, should we rely on France solely as a nuclear power? Now, Nick, I know that you have certain thoughts on this. So I think that question well serves you uh, in your, your quest for European strategic autonomy post-Brexit. Now, Thank you, Bob. Um, also brings me back to your remark about fragmentation. Of course, I didn't mean that we should accept fragmentation. Eh? We should fight fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that, in my view, is working through core groups and not the, doing everything all together in Europe impossible. Uh, this is a key question, of course. Uh, uh, what will be the position of the United Kingdom if Brexit is finally uh, done on the 1st of January uh, without or with a deal? Does a matter effect for security? Uh, it's still in NATO, of course. Uh, that, is, that is, of course, a key factor. Uh, and I assume that NATO will continue to exist and hopefully do a bit better uh, when we have had the elections on the 3rd of November on the other side of the pond. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I had already sketched that long-term trend of less engagement of the US uh, and Europe taking more responsibility. We have to do something ourselves. And in my view, that this has to include the UK, 
And that's why I'm arguing for solutions outside the EU, because it will be impossible after Brexit to engage the United, the United Kingdom in EU constructions dealing with security and uh, defense. We have this long debate about third countries' participation in PESCO and in the European Defense Fund, and it is one big misery, and we will never probably agree on something that brings the Brits, really, Brits uh, very close uh, inside uh, the Union. Um, and, and there comes, of course, also the issue of the nuclear weapons of the United Kingdom, Kim, because with France is the only European country having nuclear weapons. So also for that reason, it's extremely important to engage the Brits uh, in European security structures. Uh, I use deliberately the plural because I think we are moving uh, slowly, step by step, in, in a sort of a construction of different formats in Europe, different structures. Uh, but in the end, they're all European. Uh, uh, and that's where we have to build in the longer term a more consistent framework around. Thank you very much. I mean, Heather, in a way, they're now coming to you, right? So in a way, they're becoming your problem rather than our problem, if I can be so blunt to, to say that. But I've seen some si signaling from the US coming that also you'd expect the UK to still uh, keep dealing with Europe in a constructive way. Could, could you give your views on how this post-Brexit place of the United Kingdom fits into this actually global security architecture. Absolutely, and I may chime in a little bit on the, the reset question that uh, yeah, Andre sure. answered from, from the yep. US perspective. So, um, you know, I think it's what's so fascinating uh, to watch and, and what I'm analyzing right now very closely is the UK as it undertakes this integrated review, which I think is going to be a really important uh, signpost for where the and how the UK is going to, to manage itself in the post uh, Brexit environment. But this does place uh, an enormous amount of focus and attention on France. And what I found so interesting, um, it hasn't gotten enough attention in my view, it's a fairly small, is the French-led European Intervention Initiative. This is a non-EU collection of 10 EU countries, maybe, maybe it's increased, maybe to 12, I know others were con contemplating joining. It's outside the EU, but it includes the UK. And it's the French trying to create a strategic culture within the, the EU countries to be able to then do, uh, you know, do defense and security work, humanitarian assistance, uh, uh, evacuations, if you will. So this tells me that even a, the French who strongly believe in, a, in EU defense capabilities understand the limitations of the EU itself as a security and defense actor. So what I would continue to see is strong UK French bilateral military cooperation because the French understand as do the British that they are really the two that have power projection capabilities. Uh, that they need to work together in November is the 10th anniversary of the Lancaster House Agreement. And I think we'll continue to see strong bilateral cooperation, even though, and obviously today is a really extraordinary moment in, in the frictions between the UK and the EU. And we'll, we'll watch how that plays out. The US will continue again to, to, to bilateralize, I think this relationship and you're seeing the US, UK, US, UK, Norway, I mentioned. Uh, but uh, again, let's watch what the integrated review tells us and then let's see how much funding that the, the, the Brits can contribute to a, a new defense uh, posture in their, their global Britain policy. On the reset, yep. if you just very briefly, if you, uh, there's actually been quite a robust conversation within the US analytical community, which has uh, been a little battle of the letters. Uh, so I, I commend you, it's in Politico. Uh, so a, a set of, of very seasoned, distinguished figures that have worked in, on the US-Russia account for, for decades came forward with a posture that said, look, we do have to sort of these are my words, uh, sort of reset this. This is a very dangerous moment for the United States and Russia, and we've got to, you know, sort of go back to a reset, if you will. Another group of scholars, uh, full disclosure, I was in that second bucket, uh, said, of course we need dialogue, but we have to do this, these are my words, in a values-based approach. As Dick said, there's some things that are not negotiable, sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, our values of human rights. These, this is who we are. We, we, we have to frame this dialogue in that conversation, but dialogue is essential, but we have to do it, I think, on, on different terms. And so very, very live and lively debate analytically. Andre, I wish that this, you, if we could resolve Ukraine, things would, would 
be helpful. That was true, I think, maybe in 2014, 2015. But I fear this is metastasized across many uh, areas for the United States. And this is very much both for uh, election interference, Afghanistan, Syria, it, it, this list does, does grow. And, and so I think it does take a more comprehensive reframing of the relationship. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to where we began the conversation with this, you know, the, the, the bipolar multipolarity dynamic. Um, and I, I see that is where potentially we could reframe substantially the US-Russian relationship, but only Andre, if they follow your sage advice on the integration perspective, um, because I think there there are things that we do align with on Russia. Uh, there, there is a short list, unfortunately, but there are some things. And I think that does seek the strategic uh, imperative because uh, of Russia accepting its junior role uh, in, in China as a dominant actor really transforms Russia's geopolitical role. And I think they can retain their independence and, and, and flexibility if they retain uh, a, a more balanced relationship with the West. So I think this is really a moment of thinking about how Russia chooses its path, that the West keep that door open, but it's kept open, framed within uh, Western interests and values, and we're very clear on those, but we keep that dialogue open. Well, Heather, that would already be an amazing closing statement of the webinar, but I think it would then be interesting to give Andre the floor to respond to those, because I think it's also very nice of you to give us an insight on the debates going on inside Washington on reset or our value-based uh, open door dialogue. But Andre, uh, listening to that, could you give us your concluding statement? And then to those questions that are in the group that I wasn't able to answer, uh, I will find a way of actually mailing those to the speaker. So my sincere apologies, including to our, my very own colleague Jochem, that your question is not going to make it to the finish line. But I think a concluding statement by Andre, linking to what, what Heather just said, would be a nice conclusion of this webinar. Andre, the floor is yours. Well, thank you uh, for giving me the, the final uh, mm -hmm opportunity uh, to talk. Uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, let me reply to what uh, Heather has just said. Uh, again, I agree with Heather that uh, the Ukrainian problem uh, has already lost its centrality uh, for the US-Russian relations. Uh, and even uh, if uh, tomorrow we, uh, we were able to leave uh, Ukraine behind us, uh, unfortunately, that would not restore this bilateral relationship uh, since there are many, many problems, arguably even more important for the United States uh, than uh, the conflict in East Ukraine uh, and, uh, uh, and Crimea. So when I'm talking about uh, Ukraine uh, as the key problem, I mean uh, primarily Russia's relations uh, with its European neighbors. And I think that for Europe, Ukraine is more important than it is for the United States. It might change under Biden, I don't know, uh, but I think that uh, 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 Europe is uh, much more interested in some kind of uh, reconciliation uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and it's not just about geopolitics, it's about uh, immediate security uh, and uh, about development. Uh, so we were talking about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the European dimension, not the US dimension. Uh, as far as the United States is concerned, uh, my personal take as a person who spent a lot of time working on the United States, that we have to change uh, the attitude of the US society towards Russia. Uh, you cannot deal with the White House uh, only uh, without keeping in mind that uh, there is uh, the, the Hill, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, think tanks, uh, media, and the US society. And uh, right now, if you look uh, into opinion polls, unfortunately, uh, Russia is not high on these, uh, in these polls. And this is something that has to be taken into account. And finally, I understand that our time has already run out. But let me say that uh, uh, I do believe uh, that uh, uh, no matter what they say about the Eurasian essence of Russia, it is a predominantly European country. Uh, uh, socially, culturally, historically, we belong to Europe. We do not belong to Asia. Whether it's good or bad, it's not a question, but it's our destiny, so to say. So I think it's a matter of time uh, for us to get back uh, to where we belong. 
Uh, it uh, might be a long process. Uh, it uh, might be a very painful process. Uh, this process uh, will be uh, filled uh, with disappointments uh, and frustrations uh, for both sides. I only hope that uh, we will learn the lessons of our mistakes, both in Russia and in Europe, uh, that we committed uh, in the beginning of century, and we will analyze uh, uh, our failures in a constructive way. That will open the doors for a future realignment and for a future reset. Thank you. Thank you very much with those closing words, because that is, of course, the mandate that we have as analysts to try and keep not only that conversation going, but also to look into why these things went wrong, why they keep going wrong. And I would like to pick up on your very last point about Russia and uh, how it is perceived inside US society. I can also tell you, spoiler alert, that Russia also has an image problem here in the Netherlands and maybe in Europe as a whole. And I think what we need in order to combat that is exactly this type of conversations. It is, of course, always a privilege to be witness to a conversation between Washington and Moscow and having you, Dick, in the middle as the European who has to listen to how European security is debated. I'm very glad that we had this trilateral dialogue with you. And all that I can do is now thank the audience, thank our eminent speakers for their very valuable contribution, and hope that you stay connected with us in the Klingada Russia and Eastern Europe Center. And I wish you a very nice day in your own respective time zones. In your case, Andre, a very pleasant evening. And to you, Heather, a good and productive working day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.